Did I ever tell you about the young Zod who came to a sign at the fork of the road? He looked one way and the other too. The Zod had to make up his mind what to do. Well, the Zod scratched his head and his chin and his pants. And he said to himself, I'll be taking a chance. If I go to place one, that place may be hot. So, how will I know if I like it or not? On the other hand, though, I'll feel such a fool if I go to place two and find it's too cool. In that case, I may catch a chill and turn blue. So place more, one may be best and not place two. Play safe, cried the Zod. I'll play safe, I'm no dunce. I'll simply start off to both places at once. And that is how, and that's how the Zod, who would not take a chance, went no place at all with a split in his pants. Your Excellency, President Granger, distinguished members of the government, ministers, and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good evening. In this, our 50th anniversary year, we are put as a nation, we're particularly delighted that somebody who actually was here in 1966 and subsequently wrote extensively on Guyana and the Caribbean, a development economist of extreme distinction, is here with us this evening. Professor J. Mandel will be addressing us, and the topic of his lecture is creating a development state in Guyana. So with no further ado, I'd like in particular to thank the Murray House Trust for having us here without the normal sponsorship that they'd have. They were gracious enough, at any rate, to accommodate this event. And they did so because they clearly recognized that this is our 50th anniversary year, and as any other Zod, we're at a, a significant year where we probably are asking ourselves, do we take the chance for the next 50 years? What chance? Professor Mandel will tell us about that. Please welcome Professor J. Mandel. Thank you. Your Excellency, members of the government, other friends, I could not help but recall when I was listening to your beautiful national anthem, the time I was here some years ago when I officiated a basketball game between the Guyana national team and Suriname with a, a, a referee, a fellow referee from uh, Guyana, Cecil Chin. I don't exactly remember who won that game, however, and I think I will pass on that question. It was a well-contested game, however. Uh, my topic is, um, as Thomas said, the question of developing what I will call a developmental state. Um, I think this is, a, is of great importance, particularly for Guyana, but I have made presentations like this elsewhere in the Caribbean, most recently in Barbados. So I hope when I finish, as occurred elsewhere, we will be able to have a rousing discussion. Guyana is a poor nation. Among CARICOM member states, only Haiti's gross domestic product per capita is lower than Guyana's. Nevertheless, between 2006 and 2014, Guyana experienced a period of impressive economic expansion. In all but one year during this period, its annual rate of economic growth in constant prices exceeded 3%. The cumulative effect of these high growth rates was to increase the country's gross domestic product by almost 50%. Much of the country's economic growth during this period is attributable to the fact that during these years, Guyana's exports almost doubled 
from a little over 500 million US dollars to slightly over a billion US dollars. That expansion, however, was narrowly based. Only three products, gold, rice, and bauxite, accounted for all of the growth in overseas sales, with more than three-fifths of the increase attributable to the increase in gold exports, and about a third due to increased rice exports. In contrast to gold, rice, and bauxite, the export revenue generated by sugar, the country's historical staple, stagnated, actually declined. The risks associated with growth based on such a narrow foundation are clear. An adverse movement in the market for any of the growth sectors, particularly gold or rice, would have substantial effect on the economy as a whole. Indeed, just such a change occurred in November 2015 when it was announced that a rice petroleum barter agreement with Venezuela in existence since 2009 would be terminated. Under the agreement, Venezuela was the single largest consumer of Guyanese rice. This, the termination of that agreement means that the industry has had to seek alternative outlets with no assurance that the favorable terms upon which rice was sold to Venezuela would be repeated. One of the principal props undergirding Guyana's recent growth has suddenly di disappeared. This experience with rice has underscored the fact that the country urgently needs to diversify its economy and expand its range of exports. There was a time, not so long ago, when that task would have been considered impossible to achieve. It was thought that external forces, colonialism, neo-colonialism, imperialism, neo-imperialism, dependency, the world system, all conspired to make economic development, economic development unattainable for what was called a third world country. Under, under, under development was an imposition from abroad from which there was little hope of escape rather than exiting from the global market system. Particularly, this was understood to be the case for small societies. But the experience of the growing countries of Asia, first the four tigers, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and then others, most particularly China, but as well Thailand, Indonesia, Bangladesh, most recently Vietnam, have demonstrated that exports can stimulate development. It is now understood that with the advent of economic globalization, modernization can be achieved in low-income countries when their firms take advantage of the opportunities to compete that liberal trade has provided. But a liberal trade environment is unforgiving. It rewards competence, but shows no mercy for anything else. Seen in this perspective, development requires, as two economists, Stiglitz and Greenwald, argue, a nation has to become a learning society. Its firms must learn to sell high quality goods or services at competitive prices. The kind of learning Stiglitz and Greenwald refer to cannot be measured just by literacy and school attendance rates, not by, not by those alone. High levels of both are necessary, but they're only sufficient conditions for what a learning society requires. Re competitive success requires that the management and the labor force in firms learn how to produce and sell goods and services that are in demand in global markets. Particularly in the early years of Asia's export promotion efforts, there was not a body available to a body of theory available to guide their decision makers. The formation of policy was based on intuition, tested by reality. When, for example, China first turned to an export strategy of growth in the 1980s, its leaders were forced to experiment at regional and local levels before selecting policies 
to be adopted for the country as a whole. But with the passage of time and with enough successes, the general outline of how accelerated growth could be achieved became clear. A former World Bank chief economist, Chinese, Justin Waifu Lin, has synthesized these practices in what he calls a new structural economics. Lin, while insisting that comparative advantage still should be the basis upon which industry specialization is selected, traditional economic theory, Lin argues that the key to development is to move a country to higher value specializations by upgrading its factor endowments. He writes, I'm quoting, economists tend to think of a given country's endowments as consisting only of its land, natural resources, labor, and capital. But Lin's concept of endowments includes what he calls tangible infrastructure, highways, port facilities, airports, telecommunication systems, electricity grids, public utilities, and intangible infrastructure, institutions, regulations, social capital, value system, and other social and economic arrangements. Critically, all of these endowments are subject to purposeful change. The fact that factor endowments can be augmented means that similarly, the structure of a country's comparative advantage need not be static. What can be produced most efficiently is contingent upon whether, for example, investments are made in infrastructure, or in another case, whether social institutions are adjusted to better conform to the requirements of modern production methods. The set of endowments that are present is still determinant of what can be produced efficiently, but those circumstances are not fixed. They can be altered. And if they are, the structure of a nation's comparative advantage also changes. With that, the development project can advance. Most importantly, the task of coordinating the upgrading of endowments rests with the state. The policies of a government with regard to the advance in this sphere are the sine qua non of development. In the framework provided by Lin, the role of government is not to be a producer, but to facilitate the process by which firms move to higher value products. He writes that the function of the state is to assume effectively leadership in the improvement of hard and soft infrastructure. Lin explicitly rejects the Washington Consensus but he stresses that the public sector's role should be limited to enabling and encouraging private sector production. In this regard, he writes that in the past, many of those who resisted neoliberalism tended to, quote, overestimate government's ability to correct market failures. In short, what has emerged from the Asian experience is the conviction that poor countries, by undertaking appropriate productivity-raising policies, can shape their own futures and achieve economic success. The process of economic development can be achieved, though it is a process that will not occur without purposeful intervention by the state. The implicit assumption that underlies the new structural economics is that global markets provide opportunities, but that it takes government action, the emergence of what I'll call a developmental state, to position firms to take advantage of those opportunities. The new structural economics is far from a complete theory of economic development. It has nothing to say about the circumstances in which a developmental state will emerge. Similarly, it simply assumes that the necessary expertise will be available to enable a government to upgrade factor endowments. Further, it assumes that the private sector, 
possesses the competence to respond to those upgrades and to succeed in global market competition. Finally, it should be emphasized that the Asian development state, though active economically, is not a socialist state. Its success depends upon a close symbiotic relationship between skilled participants in both the public and the private sectors. In this, the public sector provides an environment that encourages and facilitates private businesses becoming more productive. What is omitted is a mechanism to ensure that when growth is achieved, however, and the national income increases, its distribution is fair and not concentrated in the hands of only a few. Now, the fact is that none of the, Caribbean, none of the countries of the Caribbean have adopted the state-led strategy of development that Lynn calls for. The countries of the region have specialized in products consistent with their natural factor endowments. But in the absence of a purposeful strategy to upgrade those endowments on the part of governments, their economies have not experienced structural change. This is certainly the case in Guyana when the structure of production, where the structure of production is not very different from what it was at the time of independence almost 50 years ago. I have a conjecture within, with, with regard to this. Um, my conjecture is that the failure of a developmental state to be created in the Caribbean is the residual effect of the ideological character of the region's anti-colonial struggle. The first generation of Caribbean political leaders were, almost without exception, rooted in labor, socialist, democratic, and anti-racist movements. In those movements, the opposition that was confronted possessed overlapping layers of privilege. In each case, regional activists sought to achieve gains at the expense of their adversaries. Labor leaders sought a greater share of income from employers. Social Democrats, a greater percentage of national income in the form of government subsidies and transfers. Anti-racist activists worked to dismantle the privileges associated with race. These concerns and interests, legitimate as they were in the past and are still today, shaped the region's political culture. And though the current generation of political leaders no longer necessarily thinks in terms of the zero-sum game that drove their predecessors, ambivalence still remains concerning the private sector. At one level, there is an acknowledgment of the essential role that businesses, business people must fill for development to occur. At another level, however, there is a wariness concerning the motives and interests of the business community. An anxiety that is compounded by the fact that a racial divide often separates the public from the private sector. The upshot is that historically, and I don't mean as of about a year ago, I, my cutoff is about a year ago. The upshot is that there is a great deal of talk politically about the need to encourage entrepreneurship, but little effective policy in that regard. Underlying all of this, the stark fact is that economic modernization is an elitist project. Development is the consequence of myriad decisions that are made at the micro level of the firm. To be sure, as the new structural economics has demonstrated, the state has a decisive role to play in shaping the environment in which those decisions are made. Its policies are important in creating the incentive structure that face businesses, as well as determining the extent to which producers possess the capacity to engage in technologically advanced production. But in the end, the economic decisions concerning what and how to produce reside with individual firms and their managers, not in the public realm of political discourse. The tensions that are thereby created are obvious, since modernization privileges business executives with regard to decision making. The threat of self-aggrandizing behavior on their part is always an issue. Public and political skepticism of their motives is therefore inevitable 
And yet, those business people are the proximate agents of change upon which the well-being of the society resides. Indeed, governments in the region have tended to neglect even the endowments understood in Lin's usage, which would be supportive of the current pattern of production. This neglect has been very damaging in Guyana. Guyana's ranking on the World Economic Forum in the, in the most recent publication of the Global Competitive Index stood at 121, near the bottom of 140 countries included in the 2015-16 survey. Evidence of government failure in the past is abundant in the survey. Seven rankings bear directly on government effectiveness. On each, Guyana is ranked at a very low level. It's ranked 104th on favoritism in decisions of government officials, 102 on transparency of government policymaking, 94 on quality of overall infrastructure, 93 on number of procedures to start a business, 91 on burden of customs procedures, and 119 on irregular payments and bribes. I, I won't torture myself and you any further with providing this list. It's, it's not pleasant reading. In short, what, what you come away from with this index is that it is hard to start a business in the country. And once started, firms encounter problems with regard to crime, their power source. They are forced to pay bribes to public officials. They struggle with poor roads, highways in the port. And what all this means is that Guyana does not possess a developmental state now and that it will be difficult to construct one in the future. It's in this regard, identifying how a country could go about constructing a developmental state, that Lynn's new structural economics falls short. It identifies the need to establish a state and describes what such a state should do when it is set up, but it has nothing to say about the circumstances in which a developmental state emerges. And as I mentioned earlier, it is silent on the question of the staffing of the state and the sources of the expertise that such a state will require. It simply assumes that the necessary expertise will be available to enable a government to upgrade factor endowments. Furthermore, it makes the perhaps dubious assumption that the private sector possesses the competence to respond to those upgrades and to succeed in global market competition. These omissions are important because they precisely correspond to weaknesses that are endemic in the Caribbean. The civil service in the Caribbean is not sufficiently skilled at the moment to successfully fill the role outlined in the new structural economics. Similarly, the region's private sector has not evidenced the level of technological competence that would be necessary to propel the region forward. The fact that the circumstances that gave rise, the fact is that the circumstances that gave rise to the Asian developmental states were fundamentally different from those that prevail in the Caribbean and specifically in Guyana. Most important in this regard is the nature of the political rule in the two regions. In Asia, the authoritarian rule that prevailed was strong enough to impose a policy consensus on society. Committed to the construction of a developmental state, the leaders of Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan were strong enough and single-minded enough to push through the changes that were required. Nothing like that is present in the Caribbean, and probably it's a good thing that that's the case. Here, the electoral, electoral process is entrenched a version of politics that, because of its competitive nature, tends to impede consensus building. That bias to divisiveness, therefore, is reinforced in Trinidad and Tobago and in this country by the ethnic fissure that exists between the Afro-descendants of the slave population and the Indo-descendants of the immigrants, immigrants population from South Asia. Neither the recent national election nor the local government election produced an uh, outcome that would suggest a cross-party, cross-community consensus on economic policy is a realistic possibility at this time. When all of that is combined with the residual mistrust of the private sector that was an important component of West Indian nationalism, 
The outcome is a public sector whose efforts at stimulating growth and entrepreneurship falls far short of what development requires. But I never like to leave an audience so down, so I'm now changing direction. Might be argued that this disadvantage can be offset if Guyana becomes a petroleum exporter, a possibility that has become credible as a result of recent exploratory successes. If that occurred, the government would be the recipient of a revenue windfall that could finance the construction of a developmental state even in the absence of such a consensus. Though Lynn does not have much to say about the process by which the state masters the skills re required to promote structural change, it is obvious that the process will be expensive and that the ability of petroleum resources could speed the process. Experts and consultants could be enlisted in the task and pilot projects could be undertaken, much as the Chinese did in their initial stages at reform. Thus it is that that exploratory activity has aroused the hope that oil can provide a path to the construction of, develop of a developmental state that its politics has foreclosed. There are two big problems, however, in identifying petroleum as the mechanism by which Guyana will emerge as a nation successfully embarked upon development. First is the fact that the uncertainties surrounding this, policy, this, the, this possibility are very large. There are three such areas of doubt. First, as yet the commercial potential of the recent crude discoveries has not yet been determined. Second, the severity of the threat emanating from Venezuela is difficult to assess. Third, the future price of gas and petroleum is all but impossible to predict. This is an issue of particular salience as the world is compelled to shift from fossil fuels under the pressure of global climate change. But even if these uncertainties all worked out in Guyana's favor, and the country did become a petroleum or natural gas exporter, the role that petroleum would play in the creation of a developmental state is ambiguous. Lurking in the background is the natural resource curse, the power of which is nowhere better exemplified than in, it, than in its threatening neighbor to the West. The economic explanation of the damage that can be inflicted by petroleum emphasizes the upward pressure it places on a country's exchange rate, thereby undermining the competitive potential of other industries in the country. But perhaps just as important are other threats associated with this emergence. The most obvious problem in this regard is the threat that the revenue generated by petroleum would be diverted from their intended use to self-aggrandizing individuals and institutions. The threat of co corruption is present in any situation in which substantial income flows are narrowly channeled from producer to only a few individuals and the state. That precisely is the situation that prevails with petroleum. In light of the country's experience over the last two decades or so, it's not unreasonable to doubt whether the Guyanese state is capable, yet, of withstanding the corrupting possibilities that petroleum brings with it. In any case, large revenues are not likely to emerge within the next five years or so. No doubt the offshore discoveries have generated excitement that the country may soon experience a fortuitous economic breakthrough. But for the few foreseeable future, Guyana probably will have to adopt a developmental strategy that will not benefit from a major injection of revenue from offshore petroleum production. It is therefore necessary to envision how a Guyanese developmental state might emerge in the absence of both petroleum and a social consensus on the desi desirability of doing so. What that means is that any government attempt to construct a developmental state will do so under less than ideal circumstances. The construction process will therefore be both fragile and necessarily limited. It will be fragile because public sector learning will necessarily have to proceed through a process of trial and error. 
Not only will the nascent developmental state have to learn what works and therefore should be preserved, it will also have to learn what does not work and which institutions and policies should be dismantled in order to move the economy forward. Furthermore, mistakes are inevitable, especially at the beginning of the process, when the decision makers are new to the task. Tensions, therefore, will arise from two sources. Those whose interests are adversely affected as new policies supplant old ones, and those who will seize on errors to justify their opposition to the entire project. The government opposition will be ready to pounce. Because of the fragility of the project, it will be desirable to limit the initial efforts at upgrading endowments to those that are specific to a specific industry, rather than trying to influence the economy as a whole at the beginning. Confining the exercise in this way will help to reduce the risk that errors will endanger the entire project. At the same time, the hope will be that if and when success is achieved with regard to one sector of the economy, that achievement will help to strengthen support in the society for the effort. With that, the possibility will emerge that other industries might too be identified as ones that could grow and diversify as, the fact, as their factor endowments that support them are upgraded. An example of what such an approach might look like. I want to consider what would be re required if the government sought to use Guyana's natural factor endowment of gold to promote a jewelry industry. Gold mining, as we have seen, is a thriving industry, but it has produced few spin-offs. As a result, the country remains a commodity exporter rather than benefiting from the export of products such as gold earrings, necklaces, and bracelets. Despite this fa factor, Dominic Gaskin has written that Guyana can only can one day become the jewelry capital of the Caribbean, of the Atlantic. Though he counsels, he counsels, that left to its own devices, the local manufacturing sector is unlikely to develop. In Lynn's framework, this could be done by improving the endowments that are complementary to gold, so that the fabrication and even the design of jewelry could be successfully undertaken, could be successfully undertaken in the country. If a Guyanese nascent development state were to promote jewelry manufacturing, three issues would have to command priority concern. The first is the simple fact of public sector competence. The individuals creating policy to encourage jewelry production will obviously have to be knowledgeable about the functioning of the industry. At the moment, the level of expertise needed is probably unavailable. Gaskin writes, there is not a single person in any state agency or department with any real knowledge of the international jewelry industry or even the local jewelry industry. Presumably, Gaskin's acceptance of a cabinet position in the current coalition government goes some way to solve that problem, but one knowledgeable person is not sufficient. Second, concerns the need to reorganize the institutions that currently shape the industry, specifically the Guyana Gold Board. Set up in 1982, it has responsibility for buying and selling gold. The board primarily sees its task as obtaining domestic gold production in order to sell what it obtains on global gold markets. It has not seen itself as a change agent but rather as an organization that pursues the goal of maximizing the revenue obtained from the export of such commodities. But the board's vision could be expanded. One objective that it could adopt would be to encourage the private sector to purchase and operate a gold smelter. The latter is required to assure that high quality products with low levels of, of impurities are produced by a fledgling manufacturing industry.
The absence of a smelter means that such an assurance is not possible. If, however, some of the gold board's inventory were to be reserved for domestic jewelry production, the potential demand for refined gold might be sufficient to induce a private investor, private sector, and might be sufficient to induce private sector investment in such a uh, smelter. Third, trade policy would have to be altered for jewelry production to be viable in Guyana. Modern, attractive gold jewelry is studded with diamonds and gemstones. At the moment, however, these and other materials and components used in jewelry manufacturing face a high tariff wall upon entering Guyana. This barrier to imports would have to be reduced if the jewelry produced in Guyana were to match the quality standards of other countries. By no means does this exhaust all the initiatives that be re would be required for a jewelry development strategy to be adopted. But the point is that there are purposeful actions that would need to be taken either with, with respect to this industry or others that might provide a similar potential for success. In sum, the point of examining what might be possible with regard to gold simply is to illustrate how it might be possible to initiate a process that could allow Guyana to become a developmental state. The assumption is that success would breed more success. Implemented in jewelry, these actions could generate an intra-public sector learning curve. The experience in the pioneer industry would be used to inform policy for other sectors. Having learned about what works and what does not work, developmental policies could be applied to other sectors of the Guyanese economy. As with gold, the objective would be to use the existing industries as the foundation upon which diversification could be achieved. If that happened, a Guyanese developmental state could emerge. I thank you for your attention.